guys, welcome to season three of Andy Ward's Ancient Pottery. I've got a lot of great stuff planned for this season. And in this episode, I'm going to start out by telling you a little bit about what you could expect from the coming season. And then we're going to get right into the good stuff, looking at some ancient pottery and talking about how we can replicate that pottery today. I thought long and hard about the Ancient Pottery Challenge and whether I wanted to do something like that this season. In the end, I decided I'm going to do two things that are kind of similar and kind of different because I want to mix things up. I want to keep it interesting. I don't want anybody to get bored and, you know, stop watching my channel because I'm doing the same thing all the time. I thought 10 was a lot for that Ancient Pottery Challenge in the course of doing it over the season. Uh, not only was 10 a lot to get done, uh, I was worried that people were starting to get bored of it by the time I did 10. So I've broken it down into two fives this time. The first five items I want to talk about is practical items, items that are usable, things we can make out of low fire earthenware pottery that are usable in everyday life. So I've got five items that we're going to make and then use. And I will follow the building of those all the way through the firing and the use. That way you can get an idea, not just of how they're made, but how they can actually be of some practical value. And the second five is back to more replication, which is really what drives me. That's really my motivation, replicating ancient pottery. Last time, we did all kinds of pottery. We did polychrome red wares. We did red on browns. We did plain ware. We did a gambit. We did black on white pottery. We did salado polychromes. We did a gambit of pottery types from around the Southwest. And that was fun. Uh, but my inspiration is and has always been Salado Polychrome. So those are those types that were made here in Southeast Arizona between about 1275 and 1450. Uh, they're very unique technologically using organic paint on a white slip with some red areas. And that's kind of what I've always been about. So for those five items that I'm going to replicate, I'm going to do them all as Salado Polychrome. I get a lot of questions from people about how they can do organic painted pottery. And I've made a few videos about organic painted pottery, but I don't think I've really told the story so well because there's still a lot of people out there with questions and a lot of people who would like to try to make organic painted pottery replicas, but don't really have the right materials or the right pieces of the puzzle. And so what I'm gonna do this year as it comes to replication is, I'm not only going to dive deep on Salado Polychrome organic painted pottery, but I'm going to try to fill in all those gaps for you so you could hopefully make it at home. The first part of that is making sure you have the right slip because the really the key ingredient for making organic painted pottery is to have that right smectite clay slip that will hold organic paint. Uh, and I'm not trying to drive sales, but I've got some that I'm going to be selling on my website. So if you want to follow along, uh, you're welcome to try your own slips. If you uh, want to try to order some bentonite or montmorillonite from the internet, you can try that. I do have some that I'm using that's working really well from northern Arizona, and I'm going to be selling that in four-ounce packets on my website. So if you'd like, get some of that and try it out. Now, as for organic paint, I found that almost anything can work. In fact, in a recent experiment that I did, I had really good results from Mrs. Butterworth's syrup. So not only can you boil down organic paint from a variety of plants, you can also use a variety of ordinary items for organic paint, such as pancake syrup. So in finding what items to make, there's a particular collection here in Southeast Arizona called the Mills Collection. Today, I'm traveling to Safford to look at the Mills Collection for inspiration to find those pots that I want to recreate this season, those five Salado Polychrome pots that I'm going to recreate. Jack and Vera Mills were amateur archaeologists who lived in Elfrida, Arizona back in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and they excavated a lot of ruins down here in southeast Arizona. Now a lot of archaeologists will throw them under the bus and say that they were nothing but glorified pot hunters, and in some ways that might be true. But at the same time, if it hadn't been for the work that Jack and Vera Mills did 
excavating Salado ruins in southeast Arizona, we would know a lot less about Salado pottery and Salado culture than we do today. The other positive thing I can say about the mills is, is they wrote a report on almost every ruin they dug, which is more than I can say for most archaeologists. Not only did they excavate a lot, they published information about everything they excavated. So we do have some knowledge, uh, quite a bit of knowledge, from the work that they did. And today I'm going to look at the collection that they made with all their excavations back in the day. They ended up with a large pottery collection, which when they got old, ended up going to Eastern Arizona College where it's on display. So I'm gonna look at some of those pots and see what there is there that I can replicate. If you're interested in learning more about Salado pottery and the Salado phenomenon, I'll put a link to one of those videos I made right over here so you can check that out, learn more about Salado. I'm excited to be back outdoors. Uh, the weather has finally cooled off. So if you've been watching my channel, you know that I've done a lot of videos inside, avoiding the heat this summer. And now that it's October, uh, it's good outdoor weather. So I'm gonna be back out doing a lot of filming out in the field. And that's what makes me happy. And hopefully that's what makes my videos more interesting. <laughs> you can look forward to more in the field filming for the next six months or so until it starts getting hot again in maybe April. Okay, I made it up here to Thatcher, Arizona, to the Eastern Arizona College. If you come up here to see this collection, uh, it's in the Student Services Building, which is on the southwest corner of the campus. So that might help you. It's not actually a museum. It's Student Services, and they've got the display cases built into the building. So you can browse around the building and see the collection basically all over the place. Now, when I was a kid, and when I say kid, I mean like 18, 19, 20, uh, they actually had a little museum here on this campus, which was nice. Uh, and then I think in the early 90s, they got rid of that. And the collection was in a warehouse or something someplace for years. And when they had purchased the collection from the Millses uh, way back, I don't know, in the 70s, maybe, maybe early 80s, um, part of the deal was they had promised to keep the collection on public display for perpetuity. And uh, so basically, you know, they were breaking their agreement by keeping it in storage. They had no place at that time to display it. Uh, and then they built this student services building in, I don't know, uh, early 2000s maybe. And uh, they basically built the display cases into the building. Uh, so it was part of the architectural design of the building. And now the, uh, the collection, the Mills collection is here for everybody to see. But you have to make sure, uh, first of all, that you come to the student services building to see it. But also uh, because it's, you know, a public college, it's only open, you know, weekdays. So uh, if you come through here on like a Saturday or Sunday, you might not be able to see it. Do you recall when we were young, running from all things at once, without thinking twice? And I knew we would catch up and that we would be the ones left behind The stories I've been told They never seem to leave my mind Ooh, On this road that I am on I gotta stay here for some time Somehow made it through without losing sight mm -hmm. And I still wonder where you are And if you found a way out from the dark mm -hmm. The stories I've been told They never seem to leave my mind mm -hmm. And this road that I am on 
gotta stay here for some time. Mm-hmm. Bruises they come and they go, and we have to try and keep up 'cause this life's so. All right, so I picked out five pots to make from that collection. And they are the Gila Polychrome Bowl with the parrots inside. Uh, that Tonto Polychrome jar with the wide mouth. Uh, the Gila Polychrome football shaped jar. Uh, the Tonto Polychrome Duck. And the Dinwiddie Polychrome Bowl. So I think there's a lot to challenge me there. Uh, I've never done a Dinwiddie Polychrome vessel of any sort before. That is, it's smudged black on the inside. Uh, that football shape is unusual and therefore more complicated to make. That Dinwiddie bowl is pretty large. That Tonto jar is pretty large. Uh, should be quite a bit there to keep me challenged. And I'm going to make these in a primitive setting. So this season, I'm not going to be making those pots at my workbench. I'm going to actually go out in nature and make those pots in a primitive setting. So it makes it more challenging and it should be more fun to watch. Certainly a more realistic environment to how the ancient potters were working. They didn't have a workbench and a stool. They were sitting on the ground out somewhere. And for the practical earthenware portion, I've picked out five forms for that as well. And that's going to be uh, a cooking pot, uh, an oil lamp, uh, a water cooler, that is uh, a jug for water and the seeping of the earthenware will literally keep it cool. That's how they used to keep water cool in Arizona back before refrigeration. Uh, a coffee mug, usable coffee mug, and a canister, like a kitchen canister that you might keep flour or dried beans or pasta in, okay? So I've got the five Salado Polychrome jars of different sorts that I'm gonna make in a primitive setting. I've got the five practical pots that I'm going to make in my workshop and then I'm going to fire and use. I think all told that should make for an interesting season for you to watch and for me making it. You know, and like the Ancient Pottery Challenge, uh, that's just 10 videos. That's certainly not the whole season. There'll be lots of other content, uh, you know, collecting and processing clay, uh, history, uh, visiting ruins, uh, different things like that. So if you'd like to see another video where I look at some ancient pottery collections, check out this one right over here. Thanks for watching. I'll catch you next time. <laughs>